Welcome. Good morning. Good morning from the sanctuary of First Congregational Church in Fort Worth. If you're local, you know that we received an order this past week to stay at home. Churches, of course, can continue to live stream, so we're still here, though we've reduced the number of folks involved in streaming and recording the service. Thanks to Robert and Lauren, your steady presence here is appreciated by all of us. They're here today to run the tech side of things this morning. On screen, it's just me. For most of you watching, I'm your pastor. And I so wish that I could speak to every single one of you because I wonder how you're doing, how you're holding up. I miss you and I miss being together. I mean, we're together now, but I miss the old way within six feet together with face-to-face -face conversations and handshakes and hugs. I got an email from someone this week who said, gosh, I, missed hu I miss hugs, and I resonate with her, I do too. I think of you often, and I want you to know that I pray for you every day. For me, well, some days I feel solid, other days not so much. Sometimes it changes by the minutes, and I imagine you understand what I mean by that. But I just wanted to start by saying that whatever it is we're feeling, however we're coping with this strange new reality, it's okay. If you're afraid, be afraid, it's scary. If you're feeling peaceful and rested, that's wonderful. Or if you're sad or lonely or depressed, be where you are. These emotions can be gifts too. I won't tell you to be anything other than what you are right now in this moment. As we gather for worship, all of us in our separate places, just let's all try to embrace ourselves without judgment, whatever it is we're feeling today. To begin, we have another prayer written by Reverend Kathy Bowser. I thank you, Kathy. We all thank you for crafting these beautiful prayers that we've used over the past few weeks. They help us give voice and think theologically about how we're feeling. So today we're gonna to begin with some silence that will start with the sound of a bell. And I encourage you as we pray together to post comments about your prayer concerns, joys or concerns. Last week, it was so meaningful to hear from many of you and to feel connected through knowing something of what's going on in your hearts. At a certain point in the prayer, I will read some of those comments aloud. I can't read them all because they come so fast. I learned that last week. Plus, if you're connecting to this live stream through someone else starting a watch party, then I'm not able to track all of those individual threads, but please post them. And towards the end of the prayer, I will pause and allow us all a moment of silence to just scroll through the comments that on the thread that you happen to be looking at and see the prayers that are posted and in this way share each other's pain and joy. At that time, then, I will read aloud some of the prayers that I'm able to see. Lauren is at the ready with the iPad to hand me where I can follow the thread. Well, let's begin just with a deep breath, and then I will sound the bell to begin our time of silent centering.
Here it is, another Sunday, oh God. And now we have such a different way of being together, a different way of being in worship, a different way of being a congregation. And God, you know what? These weeks, we're missing those moments we used to share in both body and spirit. All those worshipful moments that used to include the human touch. We miss the moments of speaking in unison, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We miss those stirring and uplifting moments of singing all together. And we miss how sometimes we just started clapping with the rhythm all together. We miss the moments when we passed the peace clasped hands, gave and received warm hugs, looked into each other's eyes and felt the assurance of, yes, yes, we're going to be okay. We come together in prayer, kind God, to support each other, to share each other's burdens. We pause now to scroll through any prayer concerns that we can see posted on the live feed. Pray for a friend, Laura. His father passed away yesterday. Pray for people with coronavirus and those who care for them, who want to be with them but can't. Pray for Fort Worth Essential employees enforcing the stay-at-home order, knowing that people are losing their financial sustenance. Pray for medical workers on the front lines of this pandemic. Prayers for my brother searching for work in a time that feels hopeless. Prayer for my friends who are being asked to work without appropriate compensation and protection. A prayer for those in recovery. Prayers for my brother isolated in a nursing home. Prayer for my son and I as we're separated during this difficult time that we will find ways to keep connecting. Prayer that the hearts and minds of those who are putting profits before people may be changed. Gratitude for Veronica's birthday. Prayers for family staying safe in New York City. Prayers of gratitude for our church leaders and all those who are working so hard to help people in need. Prayers for people who are navigating the loss of job or decrease in hours. So now we ask you, O oh God, to be with us, to bless our efforts as we create new ways of being church to each other, with each other, as we newly realize your way of holding each of us in spirit and in truth. May we learn to hold this congregation, our beloved community, in your same spirit and truth. Amen. You know, I think I'd like to sing a song I hadn't planned to sing. Is that okay, Lauren? Robert? Fine. Let's see if we can. 
negotiate this. I really miss Laurie Simmons and Joel and being here. And uh, I feel like we need a song now. Kind friends all gathered We're nearing the end of our Lenten worship series on the Lord's Prayer. Next week is Palm Sunday, believe it or not. Maybe I'll process in waving palm branches. Maybe someone has a donkey I can ride in on. We'll have to think of something special for Palm Sunday and for Easter the following week, so let me know if you have ideas. Next week on Palm Sunday, then, we'll wrap up this sermon series. Today and next week, our focus will be on the phrase that's toward the end of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord's Prayer is the prayer we share, most Christians, I mean. It is the prayer Christians are most likely to know by heart, the prayer that collectively shapes us more than any other. A quick recap, we have three versions of the Lord's Prayer that are dated to the first century. One is in Matthew, one is in Luke, and the third is found in another document that's not in the Bible. It's called the Didache. It is a sort of manual of the earliest church. The wording of the Lord's Prayer is a bit different in each of these first century versions. And the wording is different in the Lord's Prayer as it is prayed in churches today. Some of us are debtors, others are trespassers, and some of us just sin. And that's not the only difference between the first century versions of the Lord's Prayer. 
The ending is also different in each version. Find a Bible today and look it up for yourself. Luke's Lord's Prayer just says, do not bring us into the time of trial. And that's it, that's the end. Matthew's version, like Luke's, says do not bring us into the time of trial. But then Matthew goes on to add, but rescue us from the evil one. Neither Luke nor Matthew say anything about, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Scholars speculate, by the way, that the kingdom, power, and glory tag at the end of the Lord's Prayer, at least as it is said by some of us, that tag was not written in any of the early manuscripts, but it was so common in Jewish prayer that it was assumed, which is why some churches don't end the Lord's Prayer with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Some end simply with, save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. We'll talk more about the deliver us from evil part next week, but here's a teaser. I want you to watch next week too. We usually say deliver us from evil, but Matthew says deliver us from the evil one. Who is the evil one? I mean the evil one from whom Jesus is praying to be delivered. We'll talk about that next week. So let's go back to the earlier part of the phrase, which is our focus today, lead us not into temptation. Probably a more accurate, helpful translation of that is do not bring us to the time of trial. First off, are we praying not to be led into temptation or is it trial? Those two words have different connotations, at least to me. I am tempted by certain things. That's different than enduring a trial or being put on trial. Either way, whether it's temptation or trial, it's a strange prayer to God, isn't it? Is it really necessary to pray that? Would God be inclined to lead us into temptation or into trial? What is God's role in all of this anyway? Does God tempt us or try us? Well, frankly, the Bible has conflicting perspectives on that. There is no single biblical view on that question. The Bible is sort of all over the place about whether or not God leads us into temptation. And before I run us through a few biblical passages quickly that are pertinent to this question, just a reminder that in a progressive Christian theological perspective, such as is held by this church and many others, just because the Bible says something does not make it so. The Bible is written by humans. It contains their wisdom and understanding. It also reflects their biases and limitations. Just as anything I write, a sermon, for example, contains my bias and my limitations. Plus, the Bible is filled with contradictions. When read closely, there is no such thing as a single biblical view on most topics. Having said that, let's look briefly at some of what the Bible says about temptation and who does the tempting. James 1 says that God does not tempt people. Verse 13 says, no one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and God tempts no one. Revelation 3 says, it's not God who tempts, it's the devil. Honestly, for me, I'll say this quickly, and we'll talk more about it next week, but the idea of a Satan or a devil does not really resonate with me. Maybe it does for you, but we'll get into that more next week. In the Hebrew Scriptures, sometimes called the Old Testament, there is a prominent tradition of God testing or tempting God's followers. God tests Abraham. God tests Job. And in the Gospels, as far as Jesus goes, sometimes it's the devil who tempts Jesus, such as in the wilderness. And in Hebrews, it says that God tests Jesus. 
So in the Lord's Prayer, we pray to God not to lead us into temptation. We find examples in scripture in which God doesn't work that way in the first place, and others where that is precisely how God works. And in still other passages, it's the devil who is the tempter. Let me ask you, and we're gonna make this interactive, what comes to your mind when I say the word temptation? I'm gonna pause briefly. If you're by yourself watching this, think about it and say aloud the first thing that pops into your mind when you think of temptation. And if you're with someone else, turn to them and share. I'll give you a moment. When I think of temptation, here's what comes to my mind. It's that silly image of a little devil sitting on your shoulder, you know, dressed in red, pitchfork in hand, sometimes there's a cape, always a beard, whispering temptations into your ear as I'm looking at Robert and Lauren, my bearded tech assistants <laughs> here. No offense, guys. <laughs> which one is which? Yeah. <laughs> Temptation is implied to be a negative thing. It's the thing that we would very much like to avoid. We might say, I'm tempted by chocolate cake. Or for me, I'm tempted by coconut cream pie. Mm. If you're like me, something like this rings true. I'm tempted to eat constantly as I shelter in my house day after day. Temptation in this sense, is something that we might be inclined to do, and it may not exactly be the best choice for what we might be doing, but it likely is not gonna cause any lasting harm. Or we might use temptation in a stronger way. We are tempted to cheat on a test because we didn't have enough time to study. We're tempted to run a red light if we're in a hurry and we don't see any other cars. We're tempted to put things in our bodies that can harm us. We're tempted to break the vows of a relationship. And these temptations, of course, are more serious with the potential for greater consequences. And then there are the temptations that are perhaps even more far-reaching, insidious, though we may never name them or even be aware of them at all. The temptation, for example, to believe that we are worthless or unlovable. The temptation to believe that we can control every aspect of our lives or that we can control the actions of the other people in our lives. The temptation to believe that all that matters is money and power. Who among us hasn't experienced the temptation or perhaps the inclination to believe these kinds of false and damaging assumptions where does temptation come from? How do we interact with it? Well, that's a personal thing. The answer for that may be different for every one of us. If you want to respond in healthy ways to these kinds of temptations and others, and if it helps you to think of them as coming from an evil force outside of yourself, okay. If it helps you to think of these situations as God testing you in order for you to grow, okay. For me, neither of these ideas are particularly helpful. We're talking about interior struggles, and interior struggles come from within. Dealing with temptation, choices, for me, that's about self-reflection and self-awareness, self-understanding. What I do know is that there is so much that happens in our lives and in our world that tests us, 
and pushes us. There is the hatred that we let fester in ourselves, the things that we are ashamed of, our anxieties that can rule us, the things we obsess over and perseverate on that distract us from what really matters, the lies that we believe about ourselves. The temptation to give ourselves over to these things is real. I suspect they have little to do with God or the devil. Neil Douglas Klotz is a scholar in religious studies and spirituality. In my research this week, I heard this quote from him. I read this quote from him. He has an interesting translation of the Lord's Prayer from the original Aramaic. Instead of, lead us not into temptation, his translation is, don't let us enter into that which diverts us from the inner purpose of our lives. I'll read that once more. Don't let us enter into that which diverts us from the inner purpose of our lives. I like that. I suspect we're all tempted by something. There are choices that we can make that at least have the potential to distract us from our best selves, from connecting with a deep internal sense of purpose. Do you ever think about things like that? You know, do you sit around thinking about your deep internal sense of purpose? What life is really about? What you need to be and do that can lend your life, your very existence, more purpose and meaning? I hope we all think about things like that. Praying the Lord's Prayer is a spiritual practice that can help us be mindful of life's deepest meaning, considering the choices we face and how we might respond to them. Here are the words used by some of those who have gone before us to talk about temptation, the choices and dilemmas we face. These are lines from various versions of the Lord's Prayer that we've used in our congregation over the past year. Lead us not into temptation, Lead us not into the time of trial. Don't let us enter into that which diverts us from the inner purpose of our lives. Lead us to holy innocence beyond the evil of our days. Shield us from lesser seduction. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. These are some of the ways that people have reinterpreted the Lord's Prayer to make its meaning their own. And I think that's wonderful. After all, Jesus prayed according to our tradition. He said, pray in this way, which is not the same thing as, I want you to memorize this prayer and say it exactly the same word for word forever and all time. It seems to have more the feel of, when you pray, say something like this. Understood in this way, the Lord's Prayer is an invitation to pray and to reinterpret again and again, striving for words that resonate with our experiences. Say what you will about the difficulty of our current pandemic, and there is much about it that is very difficult. It affords many of us space and time to consider questions like this. Life's deeper questions. It's not that way for everyone, of course. Some of us are working harder than ever in essential jobs under the most difficult of circumstances. But many of us have a gift of more leisure, fewer commitments. Maybe in the coming week, we can all find the time to sit quietly, to reflect deeply on the possible temptations or distractions that might divert us from the inner purpose of our lives. Now we're going to close as we've been doing. Try to get this microphone set. As you do that, will you move the microphone down, please? Yes. 
Thank you, Robert. We're going to close by singing the Lord's Prayer as we've done for several weeks now. Some people tell me, oh, I can't sing, I can't sing, but I don't believe that for a second. Everybody can sing, and I hope that you will sing at home. If you remain generous, time will come good, and you will find your feet again on fresh, fresh pastures of promise, where the air will be kind and blushed with beginning. Friends, in the name of our God, who is our creator and our redeemer and our sustainer, go blessed. Amen.